there seems to be this for many of us. The only reason to start a business is out of fear. And I'm like that. The only reason to start a business is fear, 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 fear. And I need to keep making myself more and more scared. We have to figure out what else is out there. What else is motivating us? And maybe there's some more creativity if we can look beyond that. Hey, co-founders, welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins, a podcast where we meet with badass entrepreneurs who've successfully exited their companies, discussing everything from the wins and losses of entrepreneurship to the next steps after the exit. To not miss out on these exciting stories, be sure to subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Let's dive in. Andrew, good to have you back. Thanks. I've been listening to the podcast. I love it. Thank you so much for helping me launch and also for picking my first Twitter fight for me. I really appreciate that. <laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> I love that you went with my first or my second million as a riff on my first million and got so much attention for it. I think it worked out pretty well. And I think it was good that we did reach out to Sam ahead of time. And then also you, you said something you were like, not mean enough or something like that. And he's like, I'm going to beat you up. I'm like, oh, that's perfect. Like, that's exactly <laughs> what we wanted. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> you know what? I actually think it's a difference of style. I would not have asked Sam. I would have just done it, surprised Sam, and then come back at him later on. I think it's a different personality. You are much more of a considerate, like, I don't know making sure that every everyone is okay. And I just feel like, all right, Sam knows me. I got a sense of him. I'm going to take a risk and Sam's not going to be super hurt about this. So maybe it's two things. Maybe it's your relationship that you have with Sam, which maybe. I don't have. Right. And then the other thing is that I want everyone to feel comfortable in the room. Like I don't want to launch yes. something under shade. You know, I want it to be like a, a healthy thing that people are happy about and excited to like listen to and not just be like, oh, like they did this thing and it's not uplifting. It's, it's down putting. Right. So I want it to be a positive thing for everyone involved. And I think it worked out pretty well. I think it, it went well. So I uh, thank you for that. Really Cheers. well. The best example of how well it went was I was at a party towards the end of the run of calling this podcast, my second million. And I ran into Sean Pori. And when I was introduced, I was not introduced to him as the Mixer G guy. I was not even introduced to him as Andrew Warner. I was introduced to him as the person who was on the cover of My Second Million, and he oh, laughed. No. <laughs> and it was great. It was great. It, to me, it showed they they knew it in the room, okay. and Sean knew it and it, enough to laugh. And that, to me, shows the impact, and that was fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm glad it worked out. And it was fun to see uh, different people pop up. I had my lawyer reach out to me and he's like, you're on recommended for my podcast. And I was like, that's fantastic. I'm glad that it's getting out there. But I'm also happy for the guests. Like they're taking the time to, to spend time with me and to talk about their experience. And it's kind of hard for a post-exit founder to talk about what they went through. Depending on where they're at, they could be perfectly happy or it could be a little little challenging. So I want them to get their story out. And what a hard thing to say is challenging. Boo hoo, look at me. I sold my company. <laughs> Things are so bad for me. I don't know what to do oh next. My gosh. Right. My, <laughs> my favorite thing is there's a uh, um, Brock who is in this group that we're in. He, he calls himself like the tiny violin master or the tiny orchestra right. <laughs> conductor. And it's 100% a little tongue in cheek, but it's also really, really charming and, and kind of true. But people have a hard time. Like once they exit, it's not easy. So they're searching for meaning. They don't know what to do whenever they they have like kind of like this gap as far as having all these people that rely on them to no longer having people that rely on them. So it's it's tricky. It's hard. It's not easy. You interviewed Benji Markov, yes. who is creating something called Padel as his follow up. <laughs> I, I still don't fully know what Padel is, but I think he is an example of the type of guest that you have and of what could happen after you've sold your company. He is obsessed with Padel, but he's obsessed with anything that he does. He happened to, I think, mention what, to you that he is doing some kind of Schwitz podcast. So I reached out to him. We've been talking. This freaking guy is messing with GoPros. And then I mentioned to him that maybe DJI won't heat up. So he's got a DJI camera to record him in his sauna. That's what a Schwitz is. And then he's got the microphone. And then he is getting himself in various stages of naked to test to see what <laughs> it looks like. And then he wrote his friend in. And the reason I bring this up is to say... There is a level of obsession that when it comes out of these entrepreneurs who you've interviewed and they don't have to show up to work, that is very interesting. And the things that they take on and the way that they do it is fascinating to me and it's and it's exciting to watch. 
the amount of like potential energy in these people is insane. Mm -hmm. It's like they're they're antsy. They have resources. They uh, recently exited and they have a good network and they understand exactly who to talk to about what. Right. And they all know each other. And yes, if you put them in a room together, like things just happen, whether that room's like yes. in a boardroom or, or I guess a sauna. And that episode cracked me up because I think I had like two mispronunciations, which is definitely my thing. But I called it the shits. And so the shits, <laughs> I was like, my bad, Benji. I'm so sorry. And then the other one was I said paddle because I, I didn't know about Padel. Like I didn't know Padel. I never heard of it. Sport. And it's a big deal. Like it's, it's growing. It's, um, if you've seen like pickleball courts or racquetball courts, but it has like walls so you can play different sides and different angles. So it's a, there's like a strategy element to it. And I think he's a good example of a person taking his passion and being like, how can I build a business around this after I, yeah. I exit? That's the kind of thing that I really missed about San Francisco, that there were a bunch of people who were doing out there things and they were doing it to an extreme. And then they came up with techniques that you never would have thought of. So, for example, I happened to have mentioned his blog on his Padel website. And he goes, oh, yeah, I, I hooked up this chat GPT bot to do this. I go, what do you mean? Turns out he records into Otter AI. So it gets a transcript. That then goes into a chatbot that he created with the Benji Markov voice and an understanding of Padel that you and I, Connor, don't have, that then takes his right his words, turns it into a blog post that he could put up in his voice. Now, I asked him about it, and most people will go, this is what I did, and maybe do a quick screen share. He sent me a loom and clear instructions for how to create my own version of this, and it's fascinating, and I love to be around those people because they level you up in a way that's insane unless you're as obsessed as they are. I think that's awesome. And one thing I'm finding with these founders is that they're all remarkable and we're all happy to be in a room with them. But also there's still that insecurity around either what happened with them, like when they were growing their business or whenever they were exiting their business. And there's a humility that kind of runs through the group that I think is pretty cool. And, and maybe that's why they're so open to like talking about what they went through and kind of paying it forward. They just want to pay it make it easier, right, for other people. So I, I really appreciate that about about them. There's one thing I wanted to ask you about, and that is you posted on Twitter about your, I'm going to call it like an anti-office on your property. You made this, it's like a bench and it folds out into like a table. And then like on the fly, you're like, this is now my workstation. And if it's cold, I'm going to light a fire. And essentially you're out in nature and yes. you're also creating a workspace for yourself. Did you know that you wanted to do that with the property whenever you got it? Or did you just find yourself happier when you were outside? I did have that sense. You know what happened was I lived in San Francisco and San Francisco it's is so cloudy all the time. And you don't get a sense of it until you go over the Golden Gate Bridge, enjoy yourself in Sausalito, and then come back home. And you <laughs> literally will see, because you're up above the clouds, see how foggy it is there. And I was really just weighed down by being in an office, being in that environment, and everyone was excited. Yeah, you're in San Francisco. This is the heart of things. I felt really bad. And one time I went out to Jason Gaynard's mastermind event. I was so like depressed or bummed in some way that I said, I'm not going to work that day. I'll just drive out early. And I discovered this Corneros Inn, this beautiful little resort in Napa, huge outdoor area where you can sit. And I just decided I'm going to sit here. I got myself a cup of coffee and I was reading a book at the time. So I read it on their outdoor couch with a little fire. And I remember feeling happy. And then I went to the event and things were great. And I started returning back to Carneros Inn. The thing about that is that most people who are there are going to visit wine country. So during the day, they're out looking at different vineyards or they are there for work. And so there are conferences during the day. And so I had the whole place to myself. They would make these incredible sandwiches, high speed internet, and I would work and I would find myself feeling uplifted and super energized. And I had the internet to work remotely and it was great. I then started to think about how can I have that environment? And when we looked at this place, I saw this old pasture that was made for horses that the previous owners had and they neglected it because they realized why should we keep the horses on this pasture when there's acres of land let's just let the horses roam and I said I think I could clear it up and it took me months to clear it up with my kids and then I truthfully I hired somebody to come in and, and cut some <laughs> trees down now I have this outdoor space that if I wasn't talking to you right now I would be out there and I would be sitting by a fire. I think there's something there. Whenever we go to co-working spaces or coffee shops, it's a very similar feel. And Austin has a little bit more of a coffee shop 
feel where you can sit down and work. If you do that in Dallas, they start to stare at you and wonder, are you going to buy another coffee? Are you going to like leave at some point soon? But I like the idea of there being like an outside space with a good Wi-Fi where people feel comfortable enough just to bring their stuff and, and relax and be outside in nature. You know, Robert Cialdini is the one who gave me permission to accept this. I had a conversation with him and he said that he had written different parts of his book, Influence, in different places where he was in one place able to look outside and experience the flow of life. In another place, it was more of a university setting. And he found that the writing output and the type of writing that he was able to do in different places changed it up. And that gave me permission to say, okay, it's not just in my head. I shouldn't try to overcome this. This guy's a scientist of influence and he's realizing this thing influenced him. Even if it's the placebo effect, accept the placebo effect, Andrew, and just go go immerse yourself in it. Do you ever find that you change your copywriting or your writing style based on like the book that you're reading? Maybe you're changing like <laughs> the questions that you ask in the interview based on the podcast that you're you're listening yes. to. Yes, like, yeah. It's fresh. It's in your mind. I think the most in-touch people do that. People who are not in touch don't. I notice that when someone is really connected to people, if they walk in a room with people who have a certain energy, they mirror them or they go completely, I'm going to bust them out of their path, but they understand and they're reflecting the, the experience of the people they're around. A lot of people are not like that. Hey, podcast listeners. Whenever I was first scaling my business, Support Ninja, I was trying to figure out if there was an operating system or a framework that would help me figure out how do I structure these departments? How do I get the right people in the right seats? How do I navigate building my uh, standard operating procedures? And it was at that point that I came across Traction by Gino Wickman and the EOS framework. Um, highly recommend it. If you guys are looking for an operating system to run your business, check out EOS Worldwide. And we also made this entrepreneurship network called Founder Org. That's a great way to connect with other entrepreneurs that are also figuring out how to run and scale their business. If you guys are interested in either, check out eosworldwide.com and founderorg.com. All right, back to the pod. Andrew, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the podcast itself because you helped me produce it. And so we did go live with My Second Million and then we switched it over to the Made It podcast. And to be honest, I'm still figuring out which format is right for this podcast. Like I want to interview creators and inventors and entrepreneurs that are, are have made a thing and then what that arc is and what that experience is for them after that and hopefully make it easier for other people. But in making this podcast, I'm still experimenting with formats and I'm, I'm leaning towards a few things I want to run by you. So one is I mm -hmm. want it to be video first. I think that a lot more people are finding it on yeah. YouTube and TikTok and it's growing a lot more that way. And so if it's video first, I'm kind of leaning towards like we're having this conversation and we're out of that conversation. We're getting like these five minute snippets, which is not quite short form. It's not quite long form. It's somewhere in between where like if someone's interested about a specific topic, they can listen to that piece. And then if they're interested, they can continue scrolling or, or going through the different segments. Have you had any exposure to that or, or what are your thoughts? I think you're right to go video first. I think audio is it's really hard to break into. It's really hard to sample and people get into a rhythm with it. And so I actually, I used to listen to Howard Stern and he would say, what's up with these old dudes who are still getting huge ratings on, on the radio against me, Howard Stern, or against, frankly, he would say even music. And what he came down to was this understanding that people have these habits when it comes to audio, that they listen to these guys before Howard ever came on the radio, and they're going to continue because their morning is based on listening to them, and this is part of their wake-up routine. There are people who, who read the New York Times every morning on their phone, and they're not going to experiment with different things to read. They're just, this is it. And radio is like that to a hundred times more degree. So it takes a long time to break into audio, and it's worth it once you do, but it's not a place where you can make it quickly. And I think video lets you get people who are sampling, lets you get people who are experimenting, and then eventually some of them will go into audio. I have found that for me, because I started with audio first a long time ago, I think that I was able to build an audience. And I don't think that's the way to, to match it, to say, well, it worked for Andrew back then, it's going to work for me now. As far as video, one of the things that the guys who run Clipped have helped me understand is that when we clip conversations, if we just put a part of a conversation in a one minute format and we put it on YouTube shorts or go a little longer and we put it on TikTok, I think we're still not in the element that we're not in the environment that we're a part of. 
we're showing a clip instead of telling a story, instead of fitting in with the atmosphere. And I, I think a little bit of effort of I'm going to tell the story and then include the clips to highlight and to illustrate the story is a better approach. You'll take a, a podcast and then you'll have these disparate clips. And a part of me is like, maybe just edit and then like distill down and then have them flow together. So that way you keep the context, you keep the story and then you progress. One of the examples I really like is Alex Lieberman. He does this mm -hmm. kind of like a 60 second pitch or startup. It's kind of like a shark tank on the streets of New I York. Saw that. Have you seen yeah. that? What, what do you uh -huh. think? I love how fast he keeps people moving. I saw him standing in the street with this entrepreneur who said, okay, this is Sahil Lavinia. He is an investor. He wants to decide whether he has a meeting with you. Yes or no. I'm going to ask you some questions and he does rapid fire questions and the entrepreneur answers very quickly. And I think it's edited in a very fast pace. And then at the end, he turns to Sahil and says, so Sahil, would you take a meeting with this person? The one that I saw Sahil said, yes, it is a very fast paced, really engaging video clip. He posted it inside our group. Did you see that? He posted it like, I'm thinking about doing this. I, I got some traction and I'm looking for investors that might be open to either putting cash up front or in this case, he decided to go with a format where they're actually there, right? And I think what the difference is for me is that it gave it like some stakes, right? There's something like there on the table and it gave it a sense of urgency, right? Because this investor is here now. So if we're talking about video segments or podcast formats that could potentially be a sequence of videos or ways to get more exposure out to different ideas or share different stories, I think he found a way to take that one format that was working really well and then kind of digest it down into a smaller version. He found a way to make companies that wouldn't show well on Shark Tank because there's not a visual. If you look at Shark Tank, a lot of their stuff is like that sponge with the smiley face on it. And so <laughs> those things do really well there. But here was an entrepreneur just talking about what his software did and you don't need to see it. You can just hear Alex interview him. I was thinking about some video ideas. And so maybe you can give me like a score, like a, maybe a letter grade, like okay. we're in high school. So the first one is almost like March Madness for business ideas. So you take 24 startup ideas, each one of them has like its own video. You can either do the founder pitch kind of thing, or you can kind of do like a high, highlight reel. And then we discuss what we like about the video. So there's maybe like a panel saying, hey, we really like this, this stood out and this is exciting. And then each judge maybe gets 10,000 views or points that they help like allocate, but then the audience also votes based on what they click on. And then we kind of move through the bracket over the course of the month. I think that's interesting. You know what comes to mind, though, for me with it is, why are you doing it? Frankly, as I've talked to people about your podcast, yeah, one of the things that keeps coming up is the why, the what are you trying to accomplish? And my response is, he's an entrepreneur who's done amazing things, but because he hasn't been loud on the internet, you don't know him. And so you don't think to sell your company to him. You don't think to partner with him. And I think that this is one of the reasons why he's, he's doing this, to get people to know who he is. The other thing that I say is, the podcast is him showing entrepreneurs, here's what happens on the other side of the sale of your company, of the exit of your company. And that combination, I think, is an explanation of your internal need and the external thing that you're putting in the world. That's my understanding of it. I don't know if that's yours. And regardless, I think that we need to see it so much that it almost feels heavy handed. I think that after stepping down as CEO of Support Ninja, I had that gap. And so I just started building landing pages. I kept on trying to search for that, that person's search for meaning, right? And one of the things that caught my attention is that early on, I was talking to Alex about like, why is he doing his podcast? And he's like, I'm having these great conversations, it sparks ideas in my head. And like, candidly, I wanted something similar in that I wanted to also spark ideas. I wanted to be excited about something. And I also wanted to be tackling problems I was passionate about. And so I'm doing this podcast to help support something called the Entrepreneur Cooperative, which is like a co-op for entrepreneurs, we're post-exit founders, people that have had repeated success, the people that are on this podcast get an opportunity to help out people that are about to go into that exit process. And 70% of businesses don't sell, they fall apart. And so if I can help improve those odds by a little bit, and not just that, if you have like a post-exit founder that's kind of doing like a sidecar with you through that deal, you might even get a better evaluation then I felt like that was like the impact I wanted to have. And the podcast was a vehicle to get there. And then also there is a little bit of like, 
if I want people to know that operator equity exists, if I want people to know that echo exists, I need to talk about what I'm doing. And even though I'm an introvert and I don't always pronunciate well, like the words that I'm saying, and it's uncomfortable to listen to yourself on Mondays, it's still very rewarding to be putting, so far it's been rewarding to put myself out there in this way. I think you're going to have a lot of upside from the conversations. You're going to get to know these people in a way that you wouldn't if you were just having coffee with them and they're not going to sit down for coffee. I think you're going to get a lot from the audience getting to know you, especially since you're buying businesses now. You're leading other entrepreneurs in your organization. The thing that I would like to see is what's a lot clearer, what's our journey that you're taking us as listeners on? Show me what the promised land is in in clarity so much that I want to get there with you, that I want Mm -hmm. to suffer as I go because you're, because I trust you're going to get me there. I think you've got it. Maybe it's just more about saying it repeatedly and saying it more clearly. If I had to say it, it would be, I'm here to help you sell your business and then see what happens and have a better life afterwards. Where for many people, it's sell your business and that's it. The story's over. Here is sell your business and have a better life afterwards. There are very few people who care to do that. And truthfully, it's because just getting to the sell your business is really hard. You've interviewed entrepreneurs who've tried and failed and then ended up doing it. And it it could wear you out. It could destroy your family, your marriage, your kids don't get to see you, right? So for all that work... What happens for most people, it's I just need the sale. And most people in your place, Connor, would just say, I can help you get to the place where you're profitable or where you can sell. You're saying sell and then have a better life after sell. And here's what happens. Anyway, that's that's the way that I take it. There's a specific moment that I want to fix. It was like after we sold Support Ninja, you're sitting in your chair and you're on the line with all the lawyers and everyone that worked to help bring that deal to fruition. And what happens is that they go to the buyer and they say, do you agree to make the purchase? And they say, yes, yes, yes. The lawyers, yes, yes, yes. Everyone says yes. That's it. And they're like, the deal is concluded. And then they hang up, right? Afterwards, you go to like a Chase Bank or something like that and you wait for a wire transfer to arrive. And it's something that like no one ever tells you about right? Like you have to issue wires to all the employees and all the different stock options. And and you're waiting for these numbers to kind of come into the bank account. But you're quietly waiting for sometimes like two to three hours inside this bank account. And it's the most anticlimactic thing. Because for a lot of people, they don't know that your transaction is going through, they don't know that you had this major life event. Even if you have like a forum or a peer group, There's not someone that's like checking in with you as you go through that transition. I think that transition should be like a celebration. Like, hey, you did this thing. You had this success. Let's celebrate. Let's try to figure out how you transition into this next stage of life. I think that's something that if I can make that moment like a little bit better for entrepreneurs, I think that's something that I would be really happy with. And oddly enough, I think whenever I'm looking at these video ideas about how to expand the reach of the podcast and why to expand the reach of the podcast so far, like Inside Echo, since the podcast launched and since we got on a Twitter fight and stuff like that, we've had 120 people sign up for Echo. And we actually have a lot more post-exit founders than we do pre-exit founders. We have a lot more people that have sold their business than people that are looking for advice or about to go through that sale process. I want to figure out how do I get this podcast into the hands of the people that are going through the exit process that want to talk about what that's like. And then how do I engage with them with these post-exit founders. And I think that's where I need to look at these video ideas and figure out how do I highlight people in a way of like getting them engaged or bringing them into this process. Ah, So if I'm flipping through videos on my phone before going to sleep, the thing that you want to stop me is not, here's where the idea came from for my billion dollar business. It's more like, and then I sold the company and I wasn't sure what to do next. And that's something that a post-exit founder would understand and say, wait, what did you do? Yeah, there's something about entrepreneurship as a life cycle, right? And being able to show that to people, that this isn't just like a like a start and a finish. It's actually like for most of these people, it's like they grow this business for five, 10 years. And then after that, they go through this transition. And most likely they're going to either start a family office or start multiple businesses and and continue that cycle. Right. And if you can get people used to that idea and if they like are scrolling and then they see that like person go from idea, build, exit, transition, that's the arc 
that I want to capture. It's not just like making it big. And I feel like so many of the wealth podcasts that I see are about how this person went from $0 to $80 million. I think what's unique here is that we now are at a time where there are enough entrepreneurs who've sold their companies that they could be a community, but they're not a community and they're not talked to. I don't remember growing up seeing that my dad was in the clothing business, that there were people who were in the clothing business who had sold their companies. No, you either live with it until it's done or you pass it to your kids. There wasn't a group of people who had done it and sold it. This software space, this internet space is kicking off so many post-exit entrepreneurs that it's unprecedented. It is. And also it's a big opportunity. If you look at the millions of entrepreneurs that are out there and how many of them are inside a peer group, like we all know EO, we all know YPO, we all know Vistage, right? But if you were to take the overall population, it's less than 1% of people that are inside a peer group of some type. So how many people are building for possibly decades their business alone? and just kind of figuring it out as they go, right? That's kind of shocking to me. And it's because tech is usually pretty good about communicating and figuring out the latest tools and figuring out like how to find their community. But there's so many people that are either in a different generation or in a different industry that are probably feeling isolated or don't know how to transition their business to a, a son or a daughter that isn't wanting to continue the family business. And that's probably pretty lonely. I was just in St. Louis meeting with Jesse Puji. He's someone who I interviewed over a decade ago about his company Ampush, which did ad buys for Dollar Shave Club, Uber, et cetera. He got money from private equity for a big portion of his business. And he then seems to me to have gotten into some kind of depressive funk. It's like, this is what I'm doing now. This is all there is, you know? And he ended up getting some really good advice from a coach who said to him, what got you here essentially? And what he realized was that he was motivated by fear, that the fear of it going away, the fear of failure and all that. And he kept creating this fear in order to stay motivated. Hmm. And if the fear wasn't there, he was afraid that nothing would happen. And his coach ran some exercises with him. He said, look, why don't you just see that there's more to it than fear in your motivation stack? Like he said, go home, don't work for a full week. Just watch Netflix and see what happens. And he goes, after a few days, I just couldn't keep watching Netflix. He goes, why not? Well, I just got bored. I wanted to create. And so his coach said, you see, you've got more in you than fear. You could just build because you want to create. And then he had to figure out, what am I going to do then? Why would I even come into work? And you now have to think about, you have all this money. You could do whatever you want. Think about what you want out of work. Why would you work if not for money? What would you want it to be? And what they came up with was a path for personal growth. That if he could go into work every day and have an experience where he could grow as a person, as a leader, as, a, as someone who could understand himself, his wife better, his life better then work becomes more interesting and it becomes like a game. And so he's launching businesses with CEOs and letting them run the business after it takes off. And the reason I bring this up is there seems to be this for many of us. <clears throat> the only reason to start a business is out of fear. And I'm like that. The only reason to start a business is fear, 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 fear. We're not used to being bored. We're not used to just just waiting, right? Or, or just kind of being quiet. We, we're missing that. We're missing silence. Like we're missing boredom. And I think like that creativity, that reason, finding out what our whys are kind of comes from that boredom. I don't know how we bake that in better because it's not exciting, right? It's not something that you plan around. You don't plan to be bored. I do see a lot of entrepreneurs now going out on these retreats, which are meditation retreats or retreats without technology or whatever it is. And it's been really interesting to see them create that for themselves. I texted Noah Kagan the other day and I, I showed him something that goes, Nope, not today. I go, what do you mean not today? Because <laughs> Saturday, I'm not checking anything out right now. I, I take Saturday off to do nothing and completely disconnect. And he's created that for himself. And he might have hit on something, this experience of disconnection. Dude, there was this one entrepreneur. I can't remember his name. He sadly, he died too young. He had created these tech-free experiences in San Francisco. He would take over spaces he would force you to lock your phone away, which today when you go to comedy clubs, it's pretty common to lock your phone away, but he would do it before then. 
and he wouldn't put you in a show where you're watching. He would let you just roam around and there would be these rooms full of typewriters that you can tap away at. There would be these musicians just kind of roaming around. There would be this camping-like experience and he set it all up in, in these giant spaces. It was incredible. A lot of us would pay to go experience it and then I actually, I didn't know him at all, but when I heard that he, that he died, I went and I checked out his funeral and the, the, the number of people who were there just crying, who were probably like me, knew him a little bit, but mostly knew the experience he set up for us was just, I, it was, it was shocking. So maybe there is this demand for it. People remember how you make them feel. And I guess he made a lot of people feel a, a certain way and probably brought a lot out of people. That they didn't know was there. I think it's interesting walking into a room full of typewriters and, and different stuff. Hey, podcast listeners. I made Operator Equity as a place for entrepreneurs to invest and buy in other entrepreneur-led businesses. If you guys are interested in uh, learning more and possibly buying a business, or if you're interested in possibly selling your business to other entrepreneurs that have sold their business in the past, please reach out to operatorequity.com. I'm really excited about this new project. And I think that entrepreneurs should be buying more businesses. So if this resonates with you, check it out. Bye. Andrew, one of the things I want to ask you is you're also navigating kind of like your and have been navigating your post exit journey. Have you found some clarity as to what you want to be doing? What gets you excited? I knew that my next stage after starting a company would be to somehow be an advocate and evangelist for entrepreneurship. At a time when people weren't starting companies, I wanted to be that. I wanted to show that my teachers were wrong to tell me to go get a job, that my teachers were wrong to tell me I had to start my day. Literally at, at uh, Brooklyn Tech, we had to start at eight in the morning. That meant I needed to be on the subway by seven so that I can get to Brooklyn to go to school. And if I was late, which I was always late, my teacher would say, you are not going to make it in this world. You are going to be a failure because you show up a little bit late. And I, go, I, I don't even like your class and I don't like you and I don't I don't think I have to have a life like this where I go to a boss who I hate as much as I hate you. And, and so I was an advocate for that. And the truth is that I made an impact with the interviews that I did in Mixergy and people did say that they started businesses because they had watched it. And also I was part of a movement that was going to happen with or without me that people were starting businesses, that there were new ways of raising money and to not need money. There were new ways to do that too. This thing happened that I that I set out for myself, and now I don't know what to do next. I don't know fully where the next thing is. What I do see is there are pockets of excitement, and I'm chasing the pockets of excitement. I love watching what you're doing here. I feel like you had discovered a new group of entrepreneurs who are homeless, who are definitely worth uh, worth working on, working with, working for, and that's been exciting to be on it. And it's your ride, and I still feel a sense of excitement, which I never would have thought I'd feel for somebody else's ride. I would have thought it had to be my ride or nothing. It's fun to watch the way you work. You are somebody who's both entrepreneurial and who's super organized. And that's unusual to find that combination. It feels like there are people who are creators like Benji Markoff. I, I've listened to the other op episodes, but the reason I keep coming back to Benji is because he and I spent a bunch of time together. He will say his head is just a jumble of everything messy and he knows where he is and he knows where he wants to go. But that mess in between is part of where he likes to live. There are very few people who could be as organized and systemized as you. Everything you do is so well put together. Anyway, so I've enjoyed watching that. I've enjoyed helping Jesse Puji figure out how he can get his community together. He's another entrepreneur. He used to be super quiet back in the Ampush days when he was helping people buy ads. Now it's him being a little bit more public. And he's seen his Twitter following grow from peanuts to 150,000. He now has this newsletter that's based on his ideas that now he has some sponsors for, and that's become a business on its own. So that's been interesting. I, I don't know. I don't know if I could ever find the next thing that I'm as passionate about as the previous stuff. I don't know when this pivot happened, but it used to be that you would apprentice under someone or you would work under someone and you would develop a skill set and, and this person would get to see themselves grow and, and these people grow underneath them. And it was kind of like this idea of like this, this patron, you're helping people develop themselves and, and kind of grow and, and you get to see that and return because you've had to experience this journey yourself you get to re-experience that journey again through other people. And in some ways, I think maybe you're capturing some of that. Maybe you're capturing some of the excitement of seeing what other people can do 
with some of the the seeds that you you plant or you help develop. And I think that's really exciting. And I really like it whenever I see people from different parts of my life interact or build things in ways that I never really thought were possible or or could be done. And I think that's something that if you can capture that or put it into a bottle and kind of fit it into a way that fits into your lifestyle so that way you can still help retrieve goats whenever they slip out of the fence or, or still collect <laughs> eggs in the morning, then I think there's something pretty special there. One thing that I wish I would have done was freelance throughout. We mentioned Sean Pori. Sean on one of the podcast episodes had talked about how he's an investor, he's run and founded companies, but what he always wished that he could do is do what you just said, apprentice under another entrepreneur. And he asked an entrepreneur he admired if he could just shadow them. And the entrepreneur said yes. And for whatever reason, Sean didn't do it probably because you have too much going on in your life. And to take a week and go do this feels a little dorky and you're dropping your business and all that. What I found through producing other people's podcasts is you get an entrance and a view into their world from doing work within their organization. You get to see how they structure things. You get to see how they lead. You get to see how they think. I guess to some degree as an advisor, you get it. But I think as a freelancer, you get it so much more. And one thing that I would have done throughout my life is say, I will freelance on whatever within organizations that I admire and for entrepreneurs and business people that I want to emulate just so I can get in and watch how they work. And so that would mean I do this set thing that's easy for me because I can't have another headache as I'm running my business. It's got to be something that's easy for me that I can do simply. I will join your Slack. In fact, I insist on joining your Slack. I insist on joining whatever meeting you have for your team because I'm a freelancer who's working with you. And I will produce within your organization. And what that would do is allow me to see some of the things that I've seen now as I produce people's podcasts, see how they do their weekly meetings, see how they set goals for their team, see how they inspire, see how they lead, and watch that and then be able to bring it back. After I sold my company, I kind of did a little bit of that. I went out and I said, I'm going to see every sales organization that I could. So I went to Mary Kay. I bought the product. I became a Mary Kay sales girl. Kim Vu, who was organizing this, taught people who had never sold how to sell, fired them up, took their interests and their life into account. I did that. I went to see how, I think it's the Kirby Vacuum Company. I got to see how they lead. There was one guy who did these car sales that he had a show on A&E. I went into his showroom in Vegas and I watched, I actually asked if I could come into his sales meetings. He wouldn't let me, but I talked to him and I got a sense of it. That was very eye-opening. This is even more so. Freelance for other companies. I can make a list of probably 20 or 40 people right now that I would love to just to be a fly on the wall. We have this thing where maybe a, a few other entrepreneurs in our area, we we shadow each other. So like they attended my meetings, they attended my level 10 meetings really? and they attended. Yeah. And they uh, took a lot of notes and they, they implemented some of them. And then I attended their stuff and I saw how they interacted with their staff. And that was fantastic. And it was something that we self-organized like, it wasn't through any type of organized way. It was just, hey, I would love to see how you run your business. Another thing that was kind of like my Mary Kay experience, but a little bit different is I became an EOS implementer, which is that traction book that Gino wrote. And I wanted it for a few reasons. One is I wanted to learn more about this thing that I was implementing inside my companies and actually like become an expert in it. And then I wanted to see like what type of organization that they were building because building an operational system for your business, like the base layer is super interesting. So I wanted to meet the people that were implementing this inside of thousands of companies. I got to meet a lot of amazing people that were implementing inside of different companies. And what was interesting about this is I found a lot of times whenever you sell your business, a lot of people that were very key or instrumental in building that business may not have had the exit that they wanted from that experience. It could have been like the number two or something could have happened with the waterfall and, and uh, the equity package, or they developed like this robust skill set. So a lot of it's like uh, former number ones or number twos or people that, that help build these companies. And they become EOS implementers because they want to pay it forward and they want to help these companies build. And I thought it was such a, like, a unique like, room full of people that were such powerhouses and they have built such remarkable things and yet are trying to figure out how to build this like operating system base layer into other companies. So that's something that I really enjoyed being in that, that space. So you trained up in EOS so that you could then go help organizations implement EOS internally. So that's how one way that you got to see how organizations run. The other is you're saying you and other local entrepreneurs 
would allow each other to just kind of shadow each other and come into meetings and watch how the organizations you're each running work. And I'm assuming they would bring their laptops and kind of sit next to you, do their work, but watch you and let the ambient energy get soaked in. And it's fantastic because like the, it could be an idea that is sparked just by being in the room. Right. And that's a pretty powerful thing. And if you're inside like a, a planning meeting for a nine figure company and you're seeing how people interact with their leadership team and you're thinking about your leadership team or your portfolio companies and how they're growing and developing. It's a shortcut to learning because you're just absorbing naturally what's happening inside the space in a very distilled format. I think that's amazing. I think that more people would do this if they knew it was even possible. I mean, if you have entrepreneurs that you respect and you have a good working relationship with them, it's not a big step to say like, hey, let's spend the day together, right? I would love to see, I'll cancel my meetings for the day and we'll swap and you cancel your meetings for a day and you follow me. Like it's a very helpful thing to do. Just even getting their feedback at the end, you get someone into your organization so they could learn, but then say, so what did you see? And they could reflect back to you something that someone else who works for you couldn't reflect back. You know, another thing that I see is at my previous company, we had a lot of office space because we were going to grow into it. And there was someone who needed space and he said, can I rent from you? I said, don't rent, just come in, bring your people in. And they sat there and they all did their work together. They used our conference room and they got to watch how we operate. I've noticed that there are entrepreneurs now who will say, can I just come and work out of your space? I've done that with Noah Kagan. He's, a, he's an old friend. So I, if I find myself in his part of town, I will say, can I sit in your office and work? I've always thought of it as how can I let people come and use my space to work? I should have thought of it as the other way too. How can I go to somebody else's space and just work for the day? Andrew, that's really it for the pod. I appreciate you coming on. Is there anything that you want to share with folks or is there a place where people should go to find you besides Mixergy? Yes, I will say that one thing that they should do is I used to think that as a podcast listener, you need to be a passive listener. One of the things that I discovered is that when someone's done giving a presentation, I think it was the author of Never Eat Alone, Keith Ferrazzi, who said, as soon as they come off the stage, let them know they did a good job. Just go over and say you did a great job. And it's reassuring when you come off the stage to feel that that positivity. I used to think that as a listener of a podcast, you need to be passive. And what I've discovered listening to my audience over the years is many of them will reach out to people who, who they'd heard on a podcast and do nothing more than just say, I like you there. And if they're in their town, they might even say, can we get together sometime? And that builds a relationship that you can't get anywhere else because how many people are doing this? How many people are reaching out to a podcast uh, guest? How many podcast guests are willing to put themselves out there for an hour? It's such an amazing thing. You could do it with me for sure, but I would suggest that anyone who's listening to these interviews that Connor's doing, you should find a way to connect with the guest. It is amazing as a way of reaching out and connecting with someone and building a relationship. I mean, Andrew Mixer G is, well, is, is out there and you can find him. He's everywhere. And you guys are more than welcome to talk to me as far as like on the YouTube community chat. Um, I'm responding to all the comments there and then also check out the Entrepreneur Cooperative I actually found out about Post Exit Founders in the group through Alex Lieberman. He posted in his founder journal, hey, like to send me an email with the words, hey, that's all you have to do and I will respond to you. And I did. And he responded back. We chatted. And so you never know what comes from these things. Um, Dude, your interview with him, that was so good. He is just a natural and the two of you had so much rhythm that I just assumed you were close friends. I didn't realize that it was something that was more online and, and short. And Alex just gets so excited about ideas. It's hard to like not get excited with him. But uh, Andrew, I really appreciate having you on and uh, we'll be around. All right. Cheers, everyone. Thanks. That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter.